Hi, I'm Matt Holubowski, and you're watching Studio One. I always find it interesting how, like, um, how artists get inspired to write, and like, you would never think like reading a book and then and, like doing certain things like that, Man. like sparks it. Yeah. That's so cool to me. I, I mean, I could go on for like ages about every little place that inspired whatever. Or, like, there's a song on the record called "Mellifluous Flowers," and they're like, "What does that even mean?" And I was like, "Well, I saw the the word mellifluous. Where I have this like this huge Bible of anthology of poetry that I, I just like open, and then I, I find a word, like one word that I find cool, yeah. and then I write something around that word." Cool. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for talking with us at Studio One. It's a pleasure to get you on. Um, if you can just briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Matt Holubowski, singer songwriter from Montreal. Amazing. So the first thing I want to get to know is I know you're from Montreal, but you're from kind of like an out, like a bit outside. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to me about what it was like growing up, where that was, and I know you started out going to local bars to perform, yeah. and that's where your roots really started. Can you tell me about that? Sure, yeah, totally. Good question. Uh, I, so I grew up in Hudson, which is like just west of Montreal. It's a small uh, town of about 5,000 people, and uh, that's where I was. I lived with my parents. That's where I learned how to play the guitar, and I started um, going to some of the local open mics. There's like two bars in town, yeah. uh, and, and they would kind of alternate. They'd have one night each, and it started off with me playing open mics here and there and then uh, I guess people liked it enough to, to hire me for a whole night and, and I, I got my first gigs from, from those bars. So. Yeah. And another thing too is that when it comes to your background and your family, I know that your sister was actually the one who really was, uh, I guess, musician-esque. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to me about that and talk to me about the early music that like influenced you when you were growing up? Sure, yeah. Uh, so my sister Melanie uh, was the, the musician in the family for a long time. She, uh, she, she played like classical piano, she sang opera very beautifully and uh, she studied music and so on. And my parents tried to get me into music and to piano when I was maybe 10 years old and I, I, I wouldn't have it. I, I, I was never very much uh, the rigorous type, you know, to do that, that yeah. like classical training. You have to practice, uh, you know, and you have to do the scales and the chords and all that stuff. And uh, I just wanted to play songs, so so I gave up on that for a while. And then I, I rediscovered music early, early high school. I was like really into hip hop, like a lot of Cypress Hill, a lot of uh, Eminem, and, yeah. uh, and you know Frost and like Easy, all that stuff. And and then like that that turned into heavy metal, you know, and like that whole. Uh, teenage angst era, listened to a lot of Metallica, Avenged Sevenfold, Betray You, and I just wanted to play those songs. Yeah. That's when I started playing the, the guitar. And, uh, and so my first tune, the first song I ever played on guitar was Seek and Destroy by Metallica. And, uh, and it was only years later when I was in college and I was in a punk band that uh, I did this like, um, this like showcase thing uh, or the talent show or whatever. And these two guys were playing this song, uh, Twilight, by Elliot Smith. And the next week, I quit my band, bought an acoustic guitar, and, and I went in that direction. Yes. And when it comes to learning how to play guitar, was it something you took lessons for, or was it something that you kind of, with the internet, it's something you learned online? Or how did you venture into that? Because I know you discovered something you really liked, but talk to me about how it was really understanding the craft of it. Uh, and trial and error. I didn't, uh, I, it would have probably been easier for me to listen to, you know, teachers. I, initially I took like, I think, I think two, three months of guitar lessons. And, and he, he had this sort of strategy of like, okay, we'll let you play what you want first. Well, I'll teach you how to play Seek and Destroy, that's cool. Yeah. And then after three months, he's like, okay, we're gonna learn chords. And I was like, you're fired. So, so afterwards I just, uh, I just continued learning through like YouTube and a lot of tabs. Tabs was my main thing online and then just like trying stuff. And I, I was never even patient enough to like get through all the tabs of the song. So I would like learn approximately how it sounded and then I would just make up my own version of that song. And it, it sort of made the covers mo more authentic than trying to replicate them exactly. No and problem. while you're like really starting to love to play guitar and really getting into it, what's your sister, what's her thoughts on that? Uh, well, she had moved out by then, so she's a little older, and she uh, she had like she did the music thing, and then she sort of veered, and, and she became a journalist. Yeah. So she she sort of like the music petered out, I think, a little bit in her life. Um, but she was super supportive. I think, uh, you know, it was. I think she thought it was a great thing. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And something that's really cool too is, um, and I've talked to a lot of artists about this, those who continue and go on to like school and education and do those things, but also they want to be musicians, and it's kind of that idea of just like figuring out who you are as a person. And I know for you, uh, I think you're in teaching. And, yeah. And talk to me about what it was like in that time of your life, because I know um, you said that even with the first album that you made, it was kind of this time in your life where you're figuring things out. Yeah. Yeah, when I, uh, b- just before I did my first record, I was 25, so kind of a l- late bloomer. I started playing guitar at 17, so also a late bloomer there. Um, I had just finished doing an undergrad in political science and philosophy and had intended on being a teacher, but I, I really liked traveling a lot, so I, I was working like as a server six months, and then I would go backpack somewhere six months and come back and sort of that, did that for a few years, and at one point I was backpacking through Southeast Asia for a few months, ran out of money, and I went like, oh, maybe I'll try this teaching thing. You know, that's kind of what, I think that's what I want to do with my life. I wasn't too sure, uh, but I figured I might as well try it and see yeah. how it fits. And so I got to Taiwan, and I, and I got this gig playing uh, or, or, or teaching there, and I, I really didn't like it. it. It just wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, and so I kind of went through this crisis of like, am I too old to start a music career? Uh, should, you know, what should I do? I, I, I don't know anybody in the music industry. I don't know how to do any of this. I just have a handful of songs that I wrote in my parents' basement, and uh, and I just decided to give it give it a shot. And was that? Um that internal motivation to do it, uh, was that from yourself or were there others around you that were kind of like, you're really good at this, maybe you should really give it a push during I, those uncertain times? I think, I think I did have some people like my friends and people who, who like saw some of the shows that I did that were, that were pumped about it and they were like, oh, you could really do something, but it was all, always just this, this sort of like hypothetical idea. Uh, nobody I knew had ever done anything remotely close to being a part of the music industry or the arts industry in, in any way. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was kind of just like very uh, fluffy encouragement. Um, there was never, I, don't, I think, any like realistic expectation that I would, I would do that. So, so it really came from me, you know. And, and even when I sort of decided to give it a go, I had no idea, you know. What I, you know, I, I went back to Canada afterwards and got a job in a steakhouse, and I would work there by day and work on my record by night, and I did that until it was it was done. Uh, and even then, it took a while before I could pay my rent with it. So, yeah. you know, it's you don't always. Uh, you don't really know you, you when you don't know anybody in it. When you you have you know no. Uh, guidance you just sort of you got to try and believe that it's going to work <laughs> and so yeah. it's kind of cheesy but is, you know. is that the way you kind of look at your first album like that time of your life or when it came to your first album how would you kind of describe it because i think for artists when it's like your first or your debut it's kind of this massive thing but for others it's just one of those you're just figuring out and you weren't really thinking about the process behind it for you when you look back on your first album is it that time of your life or it how would you describe your first album? I think I think all, pretty much all first albums are like a collection of every song you've ever written, kind of thing. So it's it's the easiest in the sense that uh, you've just been carrying this baggage for all this time, and then you finally sort of put put this amalgamation of, of songs together. Uh, but I, as much as I, I was like I had this idea that I'm I'm going to come home and work on this record and, and I'm going to try to make a career out of it. I didn't really have any tangible way of doing that so so the focus really was just on like making the best songs that I could and really like expressing what I wanted to express in that in that time period yeah and on that record can you talk to me about um favorite moments I guess from like the the certain songs or maybe moments where you kind of look back and you think oh like I I that kind of reminds me of where I'm at right now because I've learned something or like what did you gauge I guess from releasing it in from, term, from that record in particular? Yeah, in terms of moving forward, like what did you learn that you still like keep with yourself in that process? Uh, I learned that the most important purpose that my songs serve are like my personal therapy. Uh, it's really cathartic to, to write songs and, and, and for some reason like sometimes if you feel something and then you write it and then it's like I release myself from that feeling. So some of the darker things that I've written about were kind of like I was living these things and they, they were inhabiting me pretty profoundly and and then once I wrote them it was like a liberation so I still try to write songs like that when I when I have moments you know maybe more melancholy moments 
uh, once I write the song, I, f I feel much better. So, so sometimes when you have a writer's block, uh, you just have to remember that that's, that's what you, you're releasing yourself from the, this feeling. Yeah. yeah. And moving forward, uh, I find it really interesting with uh, your second record, Solitude. You took a trip to Serbia and yeah. you like, talk to me about what that trip was like and talk to me about like in crafting songs. I know you were inspired by a book. Do you, when you're crafting your songs, like talk to me about where inspiration usually comes from for you. Because I know with Solitude, you, I think you read a book and about, um, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly what I'm sure about, but you read a book and it really inspired mm -hmm. like, the record. Yeah. Man, you really did your research. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, around the time that uh, um, I was wor I was like working on the idea of that record, I, w I read this book called uh, Two Solitudes by Hugh McLennan, who's a Montreal author, and, and he writes about um, the two solitudes of, of specifically in Montreal in this context, but we, we live it, you know, with Quebec and the rest of Canada, let's say, or or French and English yeah. in Canada, and and so he wrote. It's kind of this like Romeo and Juliet esque story of a French Canadian young young man and a and a, and a young uh, Anglophone girl who live in Montreal and and who who like fall in love despite the language barrier, but at a time where it was like really contentious and the French and the English really hated each other, and it really resonated with me because I grew up in, in like a perfectly bilingual household as like, uh, like my father immigrated from Poland and so I'm kind of like a second generation immigrant in that regard and he learned English but he married a local francophone. So it created this like kind of duplicity of identity or, or even like I, I questioned whether I was one or the other or if I was any at all or if I was a third thing. Yeah. So I was thinking a lot about that at that time. And, uh, but, but I know that like especially where I'm from in Quebec, like there's a it's really contentious and I didn't want to make it like a political record or anything like that so so I started when I was in Serbia is when I had the idea that like maybe I could think about the idea of solitude in general and that like the two solitudes could be one of those and in Serbia what I what I felt was it was like national solitude because Serbia was once upon a time a part of, of Yugoslavia and uh, and you know hanging out with Serbs over there and, and getting to know some of the younger ones and some of the older ones and seeing the contrast of those who lived in Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia and those who lived in the separated Serbia, yeah. there was this kind of sense that everybody was better off when they were together. Um, and, uh, and they kind of missed that and they felt sort of removed from the rest of those countries in a way that made, made them feel a little bit alone. And so I, I thought that was really, that was very, you know, sad and poetic, you know. <laughs> and so that, that, that trip kind of gave me the idea of like, okay, I, I can go down this road of, of, of like the theme of solitudes as, as a general thing. And then I started thinking about like, I was reading at the time a book called Papillon, which is about a, a prisoner who, uh, who was like on Devil's Island. And, um, and so I thought about like the, the solitude of the prisoner. And then I, I kind of went like in a cabin in the woods and I thought about, you know, the, the peaceful part of solitude and like sometimes being alone is good. So, yeah. So when it comes to making music and records, do you, have you, like, I guess, from the beginning, have you recognized that, like, you tend to get inspired by certain things and that triggers the music that you're writing? Do you feel like, do you, like, a spark comes, or? Yeah, yeah, there's always, there's always, like, this spark of, like, oh, this is, I think this is a thing that I want to, like, write about. And then it just kind of, like, sits there, it, like, plants the seed in my brain, and then I, I just, like, think about it over the next year kind of thing. And we have a conversation about something vaguely r related to the thing that I, I thought about, and, and then the, the seed kind of grows little by little until it turns into a song. Yeah, and I'm going away from the process of making records. I know you started performing at local bars, and that's where you kind of got your roots with it. So in terms of, like, where you are at now, in terms of, having performed at festivals and I think you've done over 200 shows. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you progressed as a performer and how important it is to be a really good performer and to give a really good show. It's the most important thing, especially like, you know, everybody, I th most people I think begin at a local level, you know, you sort of, uh, you, you create a following from the people in your immediate circle and then it, it, it starts to grow slowly, hopefully. Uh, so. You're, you'll always be accepted by your, your, your lo local crew and, and, and a, if you stay in that place then you never really need to improve because they'll always like you no matter what because you're like the hometown boy. Um, but when, once you get out there, the performances, the, 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 the competition is fierce. You know, there are unbelievable musicians everywhere in the world and, and there's really only one way to do it and it's by doing it a lot. 
and that's why you know on the last tour when we started I was like okay I, I we have this like sudden following and uh, and I don't really know what I'm doing so let's just try to do as many shows as we can so I can get really good at this and and ironically I'd always like refused to do that rigorous like classical style training and then it turned out that like you don't have a choice there's no you know there's some people who have like an innate talent to be on stage and they move around well and they, their stage banter is great and so on but for most of us you just have to put in a shit ton of time yeah. and do you have um, I know it's still really really young in your career but do you have like a special performance moment that you can think of in terms of I guess Kind of like realize that like I've like I've arrived that this is real, this is happening. Like, do you have a special moment or a specific show where you can say like you looked out on the crowd and you thought to yourself like this is like real for me? Do you have those one of those moments? So many. <laughs> Every show of the last tour. Um, I think it was uh, we did this one show in a city called Sherbrooke uh, in Quebec, and uh, it was like mm, pretty sizable festival. It was like. I think like five, six thousand people came to the show, and so it was like a huge crowd, and and um, and people were singing along to the songs, and it, it's like I don't have the type of like I don't have big radio hits or anything like that, so so I don't expect people to have like they're not anthemic in that way. That's it's more sometimes more challenging or whatever, and um, and to 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 see and hear people sing the lyrics back to me was just like. And that was the first time, and it was wild. I was like, oh my god, you do know the lyrics. This yeah. is so crazy. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that really was a, a beautiful moment. Yeah. And in terms of doing shows and certain things like that, um, can you talk to me about, um, do you choose certain records to perform, or how do you go about picking a records, uh, I guess, in a set and, and doing shows? Uh, well, this time around, it's a little easier because we have three records of material to, to tap into. Yeah. When you do the first record, you just do the whole record because that's <laughs> it's about an hour and, yeah. and that's that. Uh, the second, uh, the, the, the last tour, what we did a lot was we, we took the songs that we knew that people uh, connected with the most. We picked those and then we, we picked a few that like we really wanted to do, but we knew that maybe they were not going to be as into, but we really loved. Yeah. And then we, we alternated. So we kind of created like a base set list with like, okay, this is approximately the set. And then we would like, let's remove these two and try this one tonight. And we, we would constantly like evolve the set to keep us interested, you know? And this time around, I think because we have more songs, it's a little trickier because you want to do them all, you know? And, uh, and I think we're still gonna be swapping them in and out a little bit, but uh, you know, we really want to do the whole new record. So that's, that's the new yeah. base, you know? And then it's like taking the stuff from the, the two other records and complementing it without making too long of a show either. I say that to say with the new record, I'm always fascinated by when an artist releases a new record, how that impacts like previous like set list. That's why I asked. But on that note, with the new record, can you talk to me about what that was like? Because um, I know you actually went, I think, to Banff to record it and go into an, uh, your own space to really focus on that. Can you talk to me about the process behind this new record? Sure. Yeah, Banff was uh, Banff was wild. I, I was at the Banff Center for the Arts, which is a, just a beautiful, beautiful space for creation and like multidisciplinary uh, arts program. And I basically had a cabin in the woods by myself, and I just brought a ton of guitars and pedals and and synthesizers. And that portion of of, of that the creation process for me was like I had the luxury of having two months where I could just go make sounds. And I, I'd always been like more of an acoustic artist, and, and I wanted to evolve and, and to move to something else, and, but I didn't know how, and I, I'd never done it before. So I, it was just basically two months of like pushing buttons and playing things and seeing how it reacts and, and how, how it makes sense in, in, in the songs. Uh, but by then I hadn't really written that many songs. Uh, it was after that that I, I kind of completed the actual song structure uh, portion of it. Yeah, and with the new record, um, how has the reception, I guess, been? Uh, I know it's still a bit recent that you released it. Have you seen early reception? What it, has it been like for you? It's crazy, man. It's like, uh, yeah, we, like, we came out four days ago, so it's kind of the initial wave of love is, is, is pretty awesome. It's quite overwhelming. The, the most, like, terrifying thing, I think, is when you're, let's say you have a record that does relatively well, you have, like, that added pressure. 
but it, for me it was more that I wanted to kind of have a musical departure from what we've done and it kind of is a musical departure but at the same time it's still it still makes sense in the body of work but the the fear sometimes is like you're going to put out a record and the people who liked the ones before are going to be like ah this is not I don't I don't dig the new stuff and and the fact of the matter is some people do and some people don't you know some people listen to this new record and are like I've received feedback of like oh, this is the best record you've done so far and I feel great because that's how I feel too and some other people will be like, ah, it's like too many synthesizers or whatever. I like the acoustic stuff. And that's fine too, you know. Um, so, but the, the reception has been like overwhelmingly positive. Um, I haven't had anybody write me to tell me the album sucked, so. <laughs> I think that's really interesting too in terms of, um, like ar I feel like artists should have the free space to make new music and depart and go their own way if they feel like it. But with fans, it's there's always a situation where it's almost sometimes hard to continue on following on an artist if it's not what it used to be. Is that something that even in the beginning of your craft that you thought of or how does that work? Because it's definitely a common theme with artists that I've seen in, when there's always that like departing of sound and going on a new way, which I think is important to break new ground. Yeah, I think it's important to break new ground and it's also important to consider the people who elevate you. Um, so, but, but you can't like, you can't make art based on what other people's expectations are of you. I don't know, I guess I, I never really thought about it until this record because nobody really paid attention before. So I just kind of did what I wanted. And then suddenly people, um, suddenly people are paying attention and, and maybe they have expectations. I don't know, I haven't really listened to what people thought they wanted. Um, I know with me, like people really like it when I do the solo stuff, like the more like delicate acoustic stuff, people are really into that. Um, and there's still a bit of that too, but it's just it's, it's just wrapped differently, you know. But it's still at the core. The songs are still comes from the same person. The the ideas are still there. So yeah. And do you think um, at the time of your career right now, do you feel like, it, as you were saying, with um, people are looking at you now, but before I, uh, they weren't, because every artist has that moment where they can make music, and there's there's not many eyes on you. Do you still feel as an artist as I guess creatively as free as you did uh, in the beginning, or has the progression of a career it's starting to hold weight? I guess in terms of like pressure, or how do you, on that note, how do you deal with pressure on a daily basis? Um, I mean, if, if you contextualize it, like any success that the previous record had it was pretty localized, so you don't feel as much pressure when you like remove yourself from that territory where you where you do well and then nobody really knows what you're doing and that you're kind of starting from scratch so um, I don't know the, how I deal with the pressure is uh, I try not to think about it too much because uh, it can drive you nuts yeah. you know uh, and and it's easy to get into this 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 like cycle of comparison or you compare yourself with this or that or what's coming out and what's cool right now and um, I just try to sort of like kind of block everything out and just write the songs that I want to write and like as long as people uh, keep wanting listening to it, to listen to it and, uh, and I, I can keep paying my rent with it, I'm going to keep doing it how I'm doing it, you know. Yeah. For sure. And I guess in a final note, in terms of blocking things out and moving forward and pushing forward, how do you see the rest of the year panning out for you? Uh, in terms of shows, and I know there's kind of that like selfishness of fans where an artist will release a record and they'll be like, give us new music, but, uh, <laughs> right? So in terms of the rest of the year, how do you see things working out? Do you see yourself working on new music? Do you see uh, how are shows that you have planned? What's, uh, what's the rest of the year looking for you? Yeah, lots of shows, so we, we're starting the tour. Um, and we have a, like already a number of shows uh, already booked. We have a few that we haven't announced yet. Uh, and we're constantly looking for new opportunities to play in, in new places. Um, and I, this time around, like the last record, I was so focused on just solitudes. And during the tour, I, I never really thought about writing other things or I didn't have time to think about it. I didn't take the time to do it. And it kind of created this situation where everything became a little redundant. You know, after you play the same songs over and over every night, it becomes a little redundant. So if, if in between those stretches of tour, I think you can write new stuff, then it can keep you stimulated, you know, for longer. And that's, that's kind of what I want to do. And, and this, like, exploration on this record, on Weird Ones, I, it kind of, like, 
it really motivated me to just try new things. So I want to do like, I don't know, I want to try doing a side project. I want to do something uh, a little more electronic and then I want to do something more like festival, future islands vibe kind of thing. And, and then I want to do like a, a, an, another like solo thing, like a fully solo, go, go back to like the rootsy, like Dylan, Dylan Elliott Smith vibe or, or maybe like a Carrie and Lowell vibe or something like that. And I, I, I want to do something in French too. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a lot of a lot of these things that I want to do, so I, I guess I just got to get started. Yeah. yeah. Given your career, you usually tend to do things when you're inspired, and you sound inspired, so. Yeah, very much so, yeah. 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 All right, um, this uh, has been Studio One. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having this conversation with you, and uh, can't wait to see what comes your way. Right All right, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for that. That was great, that was great really questions. Yeah, thanks for sure. Studio One.